and we are live. A warm welcome to our audience around the world. This week's Space Coffee Web Talk 33 Minutes with Carla Sharp will begin soon. Thank you for joining us for this exciting event today and thank you for your feedback or about last week's Space Coffee event with Raphael Rutgen. Your comments were highly appreciated. I'm Torsten Kreening. I'm your co-host today and co-publisher of spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. Many of you know our website and our bi-weekly newsletter already. Last week, we launched our new daily newsletter called Spacewatch GL Today. Check your inbox or subscribe to the newsletter on our website. We will be hosting these Space Coffee web talks on a weekly basis. I hope you marked our Tuesdays at the same time in your calendars. Please be informed that we are recording this webinar and we will make it available on spacewatch.global in a few days. We are also streaming the Space Cafe on Facebook Live on the Spacewatch Middle East page. If you would like to ask a question, just use only the Q&A section on the Zoom webinar screen. You can also vote for these questions. If you don't, if we don't get uh, your questions are answered during the session, we will follow up with them later. And now, my wonderful guest today is my fellow ISU alumni, colleague and longtime friend, Carla Sharp. Carla is passionate about the development of space science and technology in Africa towards positively impacting the life of all Africans. She has been with the South African Square Kilometer Array SKA project for several years. In 2009, Carla founded the Foundation for Space Development and in 2011, Women in Aerospace Africa. Her personal passion about, uh, uh, her personal Passion Project was announced in 2014, Africa to Moon, a low-cost solution to performing radio astronomy on the far side of the moon. It has developed into a beacon project to highlight the potential and ability to develop of developing nations, in particular the African community, and to inspire Africa to reach for the moon by reaching for the moon. We are looking forward to hearing more about all of that here. Today, Carla joins us from the lockdown in South Africa, in Cape Town. Carla, welcome, and the virtual floor is yours. You are watching an edited version of the Space Cafe web talk, 33 minutes with Carla Sharp. Due to internet connectivity issues while recording the original web talk, we decided to redo the core presentation from Carla again. Enjoy watching the edited version. Hi, thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. So I titled the presentation A Sustainable Future on and off Earth. A lot of effort gets put into research and development of technologies to solve the problems of sustainability in space. But these solutions have applications on Earth too. And a lot of what we do in the space industry has spin in and spin out benefits both on Earth and in space. I also mentioned here that technology is a tool we use to convert inspiration to realization. I think it's important to remember that technology is a means to an end and not the end in itself. Many national governments, particularly in Africa, strive to develop technology uh, and allocate budgets to technology developments because technology is seen to drive economic growth, which it does. But I believe that technology should be the tool that is used to achieve national mandates and national goals. And technology shouldn't be the end that is strived for. So a little about me, I have a background in finance and economics. I've done a number of space technology courses and space program management. I consider myself a space cadet, so I looked up the formal definition. It's a trainee astronaut. I am not an astronaut. The informal definition, however, is a person who is out of touch with reality. 
I'll let you make up that <laughs> your mind on that. My personal life mission is to positively impact lives in Africa through space technology. And my life goal would be to see space, to be in space and see it through my own eyes as opposed to the eyes of others. I summarized my day-to-day -day life in this uh, slide. My family definitely thinks space is glamorous as do my friends. And often this is how they refer to me. My colleagues definitely think I drink too much coffee and I probably do. My boss, I'm sure, thinks I dream about space all day and I see myself as this power businesswoman. But really, every day is the chaos of a normal industry. Um, the space industry has room for everyone from HR people to lawyers to accountants. We do all the normal stuff. Sadly, it's not just all rockets and satellites. So there are two ways we interact with space. We're either looking at space from Earth, which is the recent the research that we do in the sciences, astronomy, radio astronomy, and many other fields. And then we look at Earth from space. This would be using satellites, the International Space Station. And we use this for communications, Earth observation, remote sensing, monitoring the weather, etc. I included an example here of a cyclone that devastated Mozambique last year. You can see the difference between if you were a disaster relief worker looking at the picture with the water, you can't tell where there's a road, a bridge, or how to even navigate the recovery process. But the minutes that you look at the satellite data, you are able to see a very clear picture of where you can and can't go and how to coordinate relief. So I work in a large project called the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, the SKA is headquartered in the UK. It's an international governmental organization that was established by 12 member countries. There are still new countries joining, and the plan is to construct the world's largest radio telescope. The actual instruments will be hosted in South Africa and Australia. South Africa is hosting the mid-frequency telescope, and Australia the low-frequency telescope. As a precursor to the SKA, South Africa built the Meerkat telescope. This is made up of 64 antennas in the Northern Cape, and it came into operations in July 2018, and it's been doing great science ever since. We used to be called SKA South Africa, but we're now, for the sake of clarity, we're now known as the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. And my job there is Africa Program Manager. When we bid for SKA as SKA Africa, we had eight partner countries that supported the bid, and in turn, we agreed to develop the AVN program across the eight countries. AVN stands for the African VLBI network. VLBI is very long baseline interferometry. Essentially, in my simple terms, the further dishes are apart, the better resolution you can get in space. So it's ideal to have large distances between some of the dishes. By having radio astronomy infrastructure in each of these countries, we could develop a program of education, knowledge transfer, technology and skills development, and new science opportunities. Um, the SKA program is almost ready to begin the procurement and construction of SKA phase one. This will be 133 dishes in the Northern Cape, co-located with Meerkat, and to be integrated with the Meerkat telescope. Later, SKA phase two will come into play. And the hopes originally were that some remote arrays would be established in some of our partner countries in Africa. And this AVN program is a precursor program to that. There have been many challenges though in our partner countries in terms of capacity, capability, and importantly, resourcing. Ongoing operations and maintenance are a challenge for these telescope sites. And so we came up with the program of co-location. So this seeks to co-locate data facilities, the radio astronomy, um, other science instruments, and satellite ground receiving stations. By doing this, we can create almost a cross subsidization, a sharing of resources, skills, and the ability to generate revenue and hopefully innovation at these sites, thereby creating a network of hubs of science, technology, industry, and innovation. The pilot program of this is happening in Ghana right now, 
and we hope that it will be a great success. So I think the key takeaways I'd like from this presentation, and I'll discuss further, is that Africa, and let me say here, I'm referring to Africa in general. I understand that it's a 54 nation continent with a billion people, but I don't have the time in this presentation to discuss each country uh, individually, but we face similar challenges across Africa. Uh, the different areas we're challenged by, each country will feel to a more or less extent, but they are similar. And I think moving into the era of developing space programs within these countries, it's important to avoid the duplication of efforts and expenditure. The African governments don't have big budgets to plow into space development and space programs. And skills are fairly scarce. So what I believe we need to do as Africa is build an African value chain. All contribute to a larger Afri uh, African value chain, an African industry, where we are our own suppliers and consumers. We don't, I think, as Africa, keep, need to keep looking abroad at the global uh, marketplace, particularly in space where we are challenged to compete. Um, so I'm very supportive of African development for and by Africa. I think key is public-private partnerships. Uh, as we've shown through the SKA program, industry, government and academia can work well together, sharing risk, sharing cost and enjoying benefits. It's essential that we drive uh, the building of capacity and capabilities and sharing those between countries. One important point is human capital development, and I will discuss that in more detail later. And as I mentioned, developing national programs that are aligned to national interests, not chasing space technology for technology's sake. An example might be Ghana. We're doing work with Ghana, and they suffer terribly from illegal gold mining. They have lost billions of dollars worth um, of gold and damage to the environment over the last few years due to illegal gold mining. Now, this can be addressed by utilizing real-time Earth observation data to pinpoint the illegal mines and deal with the time you see. Um, this is a need for data and not a need for infrastructure. So there are many ways uh, to utilize space technologies in order to align to national interests. So here is the Meerkat image from the Meerkat telescope in 2018 that we released with our inauguration. This is the center of our galaxy, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. In the center of this image, you can see the black hole at the center of our galaxy. As I'm looking at it to the left is a bright area, which is actually a star nursery. This is where stars are being formed. And to the left of that, you can see supernova remnants. Uh, supernova is what happens at the end of a life of a star. So I always feel like we're looking there next to the nursery at a star graveyard. Meerkat produces a pipeline of data. One of the challenges with radio astronomy is that we use significant amounts of data. We have enormous computing requirements. So Meerkat, for example, um, produces the same amount of data as watching five and a half thousand digital TV channels at the same time. It's also an interest, interesting instrument because it's a multicast instrument, which means it's able to do multiple science missions at the same time. So we can participate in collaborations for science. We also on our site host a number of guest instruments such as HERA, which is studying the epoch of reionization. Try say that three times fast. <laughs> Um, and that's looking to study the early, very early universe uh, um, at that point where stars were beginning to form. So back to why space in Africa. There are 17 sustainable development goals. Each of these is relevant to each country in Africa. And space technology or space data in one way or another can be used to assist in alleviating each of these SDGs. I don't have the time to go into that in detail, but I'd happy to, be happy to discuss it later if anyone wants to. I also thought I'd include these uh, graphs that are put together from data. 
Earth observation data and the associated value-added services are becoming increasingly demanded across Africa. And this is a new market area to provide this data for marine security, environmental management, and disaster management. Um, it's a key challenge, I think, in Africa is as a first step in space to get each country equipped to be able to access real-time accurate data or near real time and be able to utilize and analyze that data for the benefit of their socioeconomic situation. So the challenges I mentioned that we experience across Africa, as I'm sure with any developing nations, firstly is governance structures, resourcing and operational funding. If you want to start a space or science program, such as, for example, the SKA, you need govern governance structures to host the program, to implement the program. It has to be guided by policies, etc. And of course, then the challenge of funding. We are challenged by reliable electricity supply and access to the internet, the ability to store data, transport data, and the ability to analyze that data and to do science. Uh, no country wants to host a program where they can't utilize that program to produce science themselves and that all the science has to be produced by international people. So I think programs like this should follow three main pillars, one being human capital development. So the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory since the early days before Meerkat was built have issued over 1000 university bursaries and developed programs from skills training like artisan development programs schools programs and even industry development programs developing industry capability around our project and the future SKA project as well as the development of uh, and spin out of technologies that we've developed within our operations uh, within our development of the telescope there are a number of applications and now spin out products that have been generated from our work uh, interestingly now in this uh, crisis of the COVID virus, um, Soreo has been mandated to manage our national ventilator project. And this is based on the experience that our scientists and engineers got through developing the complex systems for Meerkat. Um, and so we've come up with innovative solutions to non-invasive uh, ventilators that can be produced very quickly. Um, the skills are very cross-cutting from the sciences. And I think that's one thing overlooked when we look at science expenditure and we argue it against basic needs expenditures in developing countries. Then research and technology infrastructure. This is the actual um, implementation that would be required for a space program. Uh, you need instrumentation, the surrounding infrastructure, manufacturing, uh, depending on what the program is. And that's where industry needs to be a big partner. And then, of course, as I mentioned, governance policy and partnerships. So I'm doing my thesis, PhD thesis. Hopefully I'll be finished soon. And I've been utilizing normal economic variables to assess our countries in terms of what would be the ideal level of expenditure and how should you spend that uh, money in technology projects to maximize socioeconomic benefit to a country, to maximize the economic benefit from technology growth, uh, particularly with respect to the space uh, arena. And I found that the normal variables that are utilized are not really answering the questions I have. So I, in my work, am proposing four new variables. Um, or factors really, because they are made up of more than one variable. But the first is inequality of access to resources. I think this is really important in the African context. And when I say resources, I mean everything from water, food, transport, education, employment, access to the internet, electricity. Um, depending on a country in Africa, if you have a big rural population or concentrated urban areas, um, this all impacts uh, the growth and the impact of technologies. Um, 
another point here, sorry, on access to resources and human capital development is one challenge we found through our programs is it's a great thing to educate people, but once people are educated, they need to be employed. And it's really important as you build a pipeline of engineers and scientists that there is somewhere for them to go at the end. You don't want one a brain drain to train people and lose them to other countries. And you need to build alongside that pipeline of human capital development in partnership with industry, enough growth that these people can find a place to be employed. The second point is polit political suitability. And I refer to suitability because in developing nations, there are many different regimes across Africa um, and institutional governance varies across these countries. And although from a Western viewpoint, uh, a regime may not be seen as ideal, it may not be democratic, but we can see globally, uh, China and America have very different political regimes but China's regime is, as is America's, is very suitable to a successful uh, space program. So when I assess countries for the purpose of my research, I do so by looking at whether the political and institutional regime is suitable to support a large scale technical program. I look at techn technology readiness. So this is the ability to the level of technology within a country, the level of innovation, and its ability to grow that. And lastly, I look at transformative inefficiency. I use this to cover areas such as the ability of a country to adopt technology. So funnily enough, this can be easier in developing nations than developed nations. In a first world country, um, you have the issue of legacy technology. You can't just switch to a new technology. Whereas when that technology is the first technology in a lesser developed economy, uh, they have the potential to adopt it uh, more easily. And then I classify uh, space programs in terms of the participation level of a country. So you can have a fully funded independent program, like I mentioned, China, the US, Russia, and India, India are a developing nation that's invested political will and finance and resources into a very successful, large independent space program. But what was really amazing about what they did was they made sure that that program fed socioeconomically right down to a grassroots level in rural areas. And I think it's a great example of a successful program for Africa. Then there's partially funded collaborative programs where a country can rather participate in a consortium of countries to develop a space program between them as opposed to independently. And then a country can be a user of resources. I made the example of Ghana earlier. Uh, a country can access data without actually owning infrastructure and use this data to solve their national problems. So back to me, <laughs> I founded the Foundation for Space Development. Um, I did so with uh, three colleagues, Adriana Murray, Kutso Ngoshing, and uh, Guido Schwartz. So we use the foundation to make a difference in Africa, and each of us have our own passion areas that we chase. So Guido's uh, involved in STEM and new technologies development. Kutso is uh, driving a project relating to data for disaster management. And Adri Adriana looks at sustainability for off-world programs. Adriana is a good friend and colleague and a very inspiring woman. She's a quantum physicist and hopes to be the first person on Mars. Her off-world uh, program is looking at testing humans and technologies in extreme environments with the hopes that uh, these will be useful to life off-world, but also that they can be utilized for sustainability and better and more effective use of resources on Earth. Uh, the, in the interesting test will be uh, approximately 10 months in Antarctica over a winter, uh, the equivalent time in an extreme desert environment, and then lastly, the same test, but underwater. My passion project is Africa to Moon. So I came up with a 
very general idea for a low frequency radio telescope to be put on the far side of the moon. So on Earth, the ionosphere makes it difficult for us to look at, or impossible to look at uh, frequencies from space that are below 10 megahertz. But on the far side of the moon, you're quiet from the Earth and outside of the ionosphere. So it would be first time science done, designed and built by Africa and put on the moon. The inspirational benefit is great. Uh, the potential for STEM outreach and student level programs in science is wonderful. So this project is to designed uh, on a basis of collaboration. I ideally am not hunting around for a big check of $100 billion to put something on the moon, but rather to show that through collaboration and partnership, uh, we can get there. All the work to date has been done by people self-funding and giving up their time. Interestingly as well, most of our work on this project is done um, in different countries, in different towns and online. I was asked what I thought the impact of COVID would be on um, the space industry. And I imagine as I've read uh, many programs, large programs overseas are obviously being delayed because scientists aren't able to be in the labs, people can't go to work, etc. But in Africa, we have resource and uh, financial constraints, and we've managed to do a lot of work online, like people are being forced to do now in COVID. And I think a lot of collaboration and efficiency can be derived out of this new way uh, we're being forced to do business. And I think it's relevant for, for Africa as well. Although we do have challenges in connectivity, I think a lot can be derived out of this uh, sort of lockdown COVID phase of how business and projects can still be efficiently run. And Africa to Moon has been done <laughs> online to date, so uh, we don't have facilities. Uh, essentially, the project is 54 uh, balls, for want of a better term, and these are self-inflating radio telescopes with looped antennas. Um, kind of looks like 54 uh, beach balls being dropped on the far side of the, mo the moon. Um, I was asked if I do get the balls to the moon and they do do their telescope work. Um, basically, then we've lit it on the moon. So we've decided that if we pull off this project and we do do radio astronomy on the far side of the moon, we're going to launch a 20 year Africa challenge to retrieve the balls, which we will think if we think will be a wonderful follow on project. Uh, we do hope in the next year to be able to partner and hopefully with NanoRex and test the first balls in the space environment off the International Space Station. And assuming they don't do anything disastrous, like <laughs> then we have, uh, we're talking with partners about uh, testing two to three balls, depending on the final weight, uh, in the next three years on the actual moon, which will be great. So I'll keep you posted on that. And if you want to get involved, please do give me a shout. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed that. I touched on a number of different issues. So I'd be happy to chat further, answer questions and discuss. Enjoy your day and thanks for your time. As we try to keep up with the, um, with the time as best as we can, let's go to our, a handful of the questions are, um, you guys are brought. So Raphael raised the question, which African country space agencies are the most active and also which ones actually have budgets, resources to do interesting things? Do you have an overview of that? So, yeah, I'm not an expert. But obviously, the space agency is very active, um, particularly in the space sciences and many international collaborations. They have MOUs with most of the uh, significant space participants. Um, Kenya has a new space agency, and Nigeria has a significant space program. Um, although a lot of the capacity is not in house, they procured. Uh, uh, communication satellites, but they have a significant and strong agency. Um, Algeria is strong in space, obviously their ties with uh, France. 
Um, Egypt, of course, who's hosting the, the um, African Space Agency. Um, I don't want to leave anyone out, <laughs> but I think um, uh, there are only a handful that are significantly active in the space arena with significant capacity and budgets are tough uh, across Africa uh, in the space arena. Okay. So another one are, is are the question, I heard about a plan for sharing of infrastructure in SADC and to be possible headed by Angola. Can you for, confirm this kind of information? Um, I'm not, I know there is static collaboration on infrastructure. I don't know the details of it. Um, so I would, I would rather check and respond to that afterwards and someone who has it a guess. And I'm, I'm not sure at what infrastructure you're asking about. So I, it's unclear and I don't want to lead you astray. Okay. Um, another one, um, what does have, what does the life on land and sea have to do with space? Or uh, Yazan did not understood that. Or uh, so on the SDG slide. So I'll give you an example. Um, the marine economic zone uh, around South Africa, um, that's the oceans that provide us with revenue around South Africa, uh, generate revenue of approximately 60 billion rand per year. And about 10% of that is lost to illegal fishing and other such activities. And only a small percentage of that cost um, satellites can monitor the oceans and monitor this and reduce that loss so that's one example satellites can also monitor uh, how, how, how albums, and these cause significant uh, losses in terms of seafood sea life and uh, revenue so satellite data definitely uh, mitigates towards losses in terms of life, revenue, disaster, and economic management. Okay, the last question are we can answer in the given time frame. And just to mention it to all of you, all the questions we, we got here on the Q&R section will be then sent to caller uh, for a quick answer and we will send it out by Thursday or Friday this week together with her slides and the video to all of you that are registered. So the question, thank you, Carla, for the presentation. You mentioned about capacity building by the SKA Mercat project. Space science is white. Could you please highlight the priorities and targets of these capacity building programs? Okay, so uh, it's important that I just point out that the SKA project in South Africa now sits within the South Africa uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory, so we now refer to ourselves as Soreo as opposed to SKA South Africa, just in case there's confusion. Um, initially, when we started the project, it was imperative, like I say, when you start a major technology project, you don't want to uh, create a wonderful science instrument that no one in your country can use. So capacity building was for building in terms of people who are able to physically uh, construct, manage and operate telescopes. So that's from artisans through to engineers. And then the capacity in terms of building a pipeline of scientists that can do the science and utilize these, this, these instruments. So South Africa over the period, sorry, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory over the period of the building uh, distributed over a thousand bursaries um, and uh, participated in providing teachers and bursaries to the schools in the surrounding areas. The building has um, been a significant process so that South Africa is quick to make the most out of this project. We've also had a number of industry development programs to develop industry and technologies uh, beyond radio astronomy and spin out uh, some of the technologies we developed that have wider application. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, 
we know we can run that for quite some time. Uh, we will follow up with uh, all your questions uh, again in this email. If you have further questions, please feel free to send it, them to us at um, spacecafe at spacewatch.global. So um, in general, we will follow up on the space development in Africa in our series and in our magazine. So our next webinars are, are on the 21st of April with Dr. Brian Whedon from the Secure World Foundation, who will brief us about the 2020 edition of the Counter Space Capacity Study, followed by the 28th of April with Daniel Porras on the question, is it too late to prevent an arms race in outer space? And I'm happy to announce here first that on 5th of May, I will talk with Frank Salzgeber from ESA about ESA's support of space entrepreneurs. We would like to hear your feedback, so please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And if you're interested in being a guest on our 33 Minutes with, please let us let me know. So don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. One spoiler for you, tomorrow morning, we will release our first Space Cafe podcast on our website. Tune in, it's pretty cool. So again, Carla, thank you very much uh, for having you here as a guest on the Space Cafe. And um, so we, I think we all experience the challenges Africa has when it comes to internet, um, just as a small issue. Thanks again for all of you participants uh, worldwide and um, to my entire team behind the scene. So stay safe, wash your hands, and thanks for joining us. See you next week, hopefully. Bye for now. Bye.